You know, the first of the year is kind of a first fruits is really the way I see it. And there's a first fruits principle that goes all throughout the word of God. And it shows if I'll cut off a piece of what God has given me. And I'll take the first and I'll take the best. And I'll bring it and I'll present it unto God. Dedicate it unto him that God will come and he'll bless the rest of what I have. There was a principle they, they did in the Old Testament. And a lot of times we talk about the tithe and first fruits and it sounds like the same thing, but it wasn't the same thing during Old Testament days. The first fruits was an offering that people would come and they would give to the house of God. So you're talking in an agrarian culture, talking about farmers, anybody out there raised in, in a farm, on a farm, anybody like that? I was, I guess there's more of you right there, there's my people. And uh, I was raised on a farm. So, so what you would do is you would put out your crop and the first bit of fruit that starts to be produced, or buds, right, the produce that comes out, you would go and tie a ribbon around that portion, and you would dedicate it as the first fruits unto God. And you were saying that you're going to take this portion, and you're going to give it to God whenever it comes to full fruition. It belongs to Him. And you were believing if you presented that unto God, that God was going to bless the rest. And it's a faith offering, because you don't have a crop yet. You don't have a harvest yet. You don't know if a hailstorm's coming that's going to destroy the rest of the crop. You don't know if a uh, fire's going to come through the land. You don't know if rain's not going to fall. It takes faith to give God the first. But God looks down and he sees whenever people give him the first, God says, I'm going to put my hand not just on your first, on your middle, and on your last. And the alpha and the omega blesses the A through the Z, and he pours out his spirit on everything that you do. What I declare over your life is God's going to pour out his spirit on our life because we're going to give him the first fruit through prayer, come on somebody, through fasting and through giving in the first of the year. And God's going to bless our 2023. I believe that this year is going to be a great year. Come on, somebody say 2023 is blessed. Let's say it out loud. I believe it's blessed in Jesus' mighty name. So how do we give these first fruits? Here's what we're going to do as a church at every location. Uh, Jesus had three when yous he talked about. They weren't if use, but they were when use. And they were things that he believed that every follower of his or every Christian would do. The, the, I want you to open up your Bible if you have it on you this morning. Go ahead and go to the Gospel of St. Matthew. And I'm going to show you the when use from Jesus. And um, I learned the when use from one of my mentors. And he learned them uh, from Seoul, Korea, Dr. Young E. Cho. Pioneer of the largest church in the world. Do you know there was a church in one city, one place that became a one million member church? I was just there in, in October. And um, Dr. Rogers is a mentor of mine. He's in his 70s now. But he started going there when he's like an 18-year-old kid. And that church had already hit 20 or 30,000. And they walked into the sanctuary. Him and his father walked into the sanctuary uh, of Dr. Cho's church in Seoul, Korea. And they were in there praying in the sanctuary. And they were there to learn the secret of how did this become the fastest growing church in the world, right? And, and so Dr. Rogers' father was a pastor as well, walks up to a, a, a lady in, in the uh, sanctuary and says, tell me the secret of why so many people get saved here. How many of y'all would like to see thousands of people saved in our churches in 2023. Anybody like to see thousands of people born again in our churches? How many of y'all like to see full altars of people repenting and getting right with God? How many of y'all like to see signs and wonders, miracles? How many, how many of y'all want to be a blessing to somebody else? God to bless you so much you're not looking to be blessed, but you become a blessing. I want that. Does anybody else want that? These guys went to Korea to try to get that. And they walk up in the sanctuary and listen, I've went around the world trying to get something from another person of God, right? That anointing. How do, how do I get what's on you on me because what's on you is working right now? I've been around the world for that kind of stuff. And he walked in and said, how, how, did, this, how, how did this happen? And uh, the lady looked at, at, at Dr. Wayman Rogers and said these words, pointing up into heaven and said, pray, pray, pray. Come on, everybody say, pray, 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 right? Pray, pray, pray. Then she pointed at his belly and said, fast, fast, fast. He didn't think he, he, he didn't, he thought there was a language barrier, right? It's like, she didn't know what I'm saying. And, and she said it again. She looked at him and said, pray, pray, pray. Come on, somebody say, pray, pray, pray. And then she pointed his belly. Everybody say, fast, 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 right? We're going to pray, 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 fast, 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 give, give, give. And God's going to bless, bless, bless in 2023. I believe that. So 
here's, here's where that comes from. It didn't come from Dr. Job. It came from Jesus. All right. Ma- Matthew chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. Jesus says this. He says, but when you. Everybody say, when you. Didn't say if you. He said, when you. Right? But when you do a charitable deed. He's talking about an alm here, giving to the poor. When you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right is doing. That your charitable deed may be in secret. That your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. All right, so Jesus talks about his followers and he says this. He says that when you, not if you, but when you. These are the when you's. He said when you do a charitable deed. He's talking about giving an alm. All right, this isn't every type of an offering. There were public offerings in the temple where people gave at the same time. But this is where he's talking about giving to the poor. And whenever you're giving to somebody that needs help financially, how many know the last thing you want to do is to dishonor the person you're helping by embarrassing them that they're receiving help? How many of y'all have ever needed some help financially in your life before? Come on. I've needed some help. Now, I'm thankful right? I know what it's like. Jesse and I were married 22 and 19. We had nothing when we got married. I married Jesse because she, for her money. I married her for her money. She married me for my looks is, is what happened here. Now, uh, she had, she had $1,200 when we got married. That's big money for a 19 year old kid. And, and, 2000, right? I had zero dollars, right? I told my dad, I love Jesse. I want to get married. And he so wanted me to marry her because he was afraid of who I might bring home to the house that he, uh, he, he, he loved her. He got, he's like, I'm going to take you. My dad took me and bought, bought a ring for me to marry Jesse before she could get away. How many of us a smart dad? Can I get an amen out there? Smart dad, right? And we didn't have, we didn't have money. People helped us when we got started. And I'm thankful that the people that helped me didn't embarrass me. Aren't y'all thankful for that? Don't y'all want to be that kind of person in somebody else's life? Tell you what, I'm 45. I'm not, I'm not old, but I'm not young. And I want to help the 20-year-olds in our church get ahead in life. How many of y'all want to help some of them? I, li- I, like, I, li- I think some of you men and women that know what you're doing a little bit in life, you ought to help them get ahead in business. You ought to look for our kids a place to get a better job. Huh? If we can start them in an industry, and you know an industry, you ought to start them in the industry. Come on, somebody. How many of y'all think we ought to teach ours how to sell? Teach ours how to build? Teach ours how to make some stuff out of nothing? I think we ought to make the next generation. We ought to help them. Right? I don't like that you're 18, go do it on your own. No. This is the father's house. We help the father's sons and daughters. We're going to teach them and train them and lift them. Come on. At every location, we ought to make the next generation the best generation by pouring into their life. So, so Jesus said this. He said, whenever you help somebody, right, don't let your left hand know what your right is doing. He said, do it in, do it in private. All right, so when you're doing individual giving and giving to help somebody else, you do that privately. Now, there are many offerings in the, in the Bible that are public. Some people will use this because they never want to come clean that they never give or take care of the house of God. Right? It's public time to build a building. Whenever they built the temple, everybody brings their money and it's public and they present it all throughout the Bible. In the New Testament, after Jesus says this, there's an offering in Acts chapter 5 or 6. How many of y'all have heard of the story of Ananias and Sapphira? Ananias and Sapphira said, we're going to bring a certain amount of money. Nobody told them they had to. Nobody asked them to do this. They just said it. We're going to bring a certain amount of money. We're going to give. We've sold a piece of property. We want to be a blessing to the church. And Peter says, okay, bring it on in. And so it's time for them to bring it. They come and they lied about it. And they weren't lying to Peter or the church. The Bible says they were lying to the Holy Spirit. So they don't do what they say they're going to do. They set it up because they want everybody to see them giving in a certain way when they're really just lying about it. And they get up to the altar to give their offering. The power of God hits them and they fall down dead. How many think that'll change the atmosphere in a church service? Huh? I mean, that'll get the giving straightened out real fast, right? It's like, oh, dear Jesus, I'm going to pay all my tithes I didn't pay in 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. I'm going to get right with God. Amen. So there's a time for public giving. Public giving teaches young people how to do private giving. Same thing with prayer. Let me show you this. Turn over to Matthew 6, 7, and 8. Jesus talks about praying. How many of y'all think it's okay to have a public prayer meeting? Amen. I learned to pray in public prayer meetings, watching people pray. All right, here's what Jesus said. But there's a time for private prayer. He says this, and when you pray, 
Don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think they'll be heard for their many words. Therefore do not be like them. For your father knows the things that you have need of before you ask. It says when you pray, don't, don't, don't pray and use repetitions and try to be seen by everybody. He doesn't say if you pray. He says when you pray. Come on, everybody say when you. All right, when you pray, pray like this. Later on in this text, he tells them to go into their closet and pray alone. So listen, we don't pray to be seen by people praying. We pray because we want to connect with heaven. And what we do in private, God will reward you then openly is what the scripture says. There's power in prayer. So private prayer is powerful. But the only way people learn to pray privately is there has to be public prayer and prayer meetings in church for them to learn to pray privately. In the book of Acts, they came together even after Jesus said this, and the church prayed corporately, right? There's individual prayer, there's corporate prayer. There's individual giving, there's corporate giving. There's individual fasting, and then there's corporate fasting. Whenever I, I, I learned how to pray, I'll give you an example, I, I, I didn't naturally fall into prayer real easy. Reading the Bible and studying has always been easy for me. I always love to read. Something I got from my father. My father read all the time. Now I can remember being like seven, eight, nine years old. Dad read those John Grisham, those attorney novels that are all from the South back in the 90s and 2000s. Anybody ever read a, a John Grisham no novel like A Time to Kill and all that kind of stuff? I remember being like seven or eight years old reading A Time to Kill. Probably wasn't age appropriate reading, but my dad didn't care at the time. And uh, I learned to love to read from my father. And so early on, we got married. It didn't matter where we go, I always had a book. This is before the cell phone, right? Now I feel like it's dumbed me down a little bit because I got YouTube. And now they've got shorts which are like mind-numbing and can get you. How many of y'all have ever sat down to watch some shorts and you look up like 72 hours later? You're wearing the same clothes, right? You haven't showered or done anything. That's the devil, isn't it? I mean, talk about mindless. This is mindless, but I would read all the time. Uh, back in the day, even when we went shopping, I'd take a book with me. I'd walk Jesse the store. I hate shopping, so I'd let her go in the store. I'd walk outside, and I'd read the book. Um, so, so when it, I became a Christian, reading the Bible was easy. I love to read the Bible. I love the background of the Bible. I love the history of the Bible. I love the political scene that was going on whenever Jesus is saying the things that he's saying. Because the words of the Bible come from a context. I like all that, that study. And that was easy for me. But what was hard for me was praying. Didn't know how to pray. Didn't know how to connect with God. Didn't know a lot about, you know, expressing my heart or, or intimacy like that. It was weird for me. I would watch Jesse pray. Jesse was raised in a spirit-filled church right here, leading worship in prayer meetings from when she was this, this tall, you know, start to pray. She could do it. And I just, I had two or three things to pray and then I'd be done. So what I did is I got a time to pray. I decided I'm not going to be an if you pray, I'm going to be a when you pray kind of Christian. Come on, somebody. How many of y'all think we ought to be a when you pray instead of an if you pray, Right? So I did that. I got a time I would pray. And I started writing down scriptures. I got things I would pray. Now I memorized the Lord's Prayer. And I memorized the 23rd Psalm. And I memorized Psalm 1. And I memorized the first chapter of John. And I would pray through these things so I would know what to pray. And it began to change my life. I started going into my closet way back in the day. I'd get in the closet. I, I lived in those apartments over here. I think they're off of Bell and 45th or Bell and 30. 34, somewhere over there. I can't even remember where I live, but I could take you there today. Um, I had a closet in there. I took a chair literally, like the words of Jesus, took them in my closet, that chair, set it down in my closet, and I would walk into that closet, close the door behind me, open up all the things I'd written down to pray, and I would pray. And I set a timer to make myself stand there to learn how to pray. And I'll tell you what, when I learned how to pray, God started moving in my life. When I made just a little effort to connect with God, it's like God made all the effort in the world to connect with me, right? It was like work when I first started going in there. But I'll tell you what, after I went a little bit, I remember laying in my bed, and it was like I could feel the presence of God coming out of my closet, drawing me into that room. It's like he started showing up in his manifest presence before I ever got there. I'll tell you what, if you'll become a when you pray, God will show his glory on your behalf. Come on. Somebody give God a hand clap every location. If you believe our God's going to meet with us. Amen? When we pray. Jesus went on and he didn't say, if you fast, 
He said, when you fast. Come on, turn to your neighbor and tell him, when you fast. Tell him that, when you fast. Huh? Didn't say if you fast. Y'all bring the house lights up for me. He said, he said, when you fast. And he said, when you fast, don't be like the religious, you know. Don't, uh, don't uh, discontort your face. Don't dishevel your clothes. Don't look like you're all messed up. Don't make a big deal so everybody sees that you're fasting. He said, whenever you fast, dress up sharp. Anoint your head with oil. Come on, put some, put some gel on that mop of yours, amen? Dude, dude, doll that stuff up, right? Look good. Don't be like them. When you fast, fast in, in secret. There's a time for personal, private fasting. But even after Jesus said this, do you know what the book of Acts church did whenever they got together sometimes? They fasted corporately. So there's a time for private fasting. There's a time for corporate fasting. And I was raised in a church that never taught corporate fasting. Anybody raised in a church that never mentioned fasting? Anybody else? Never mentioned fasting in the church I was raised in. Uh, I, I'd heard of fasting, I read it in the Bible, but it was never talked about. So it wasn't practiced, so we didn't know how to do it. And I, I know this about fasting, there are certain things you will never get done in your life until you become a when you fast, not an if you fast. In Matthew chapter nine, you can read this later, but Matthew chapter nine, or excuse me, Mark chapter nine, there's a demon possessed person. It's brought to the disciples of Jesus. And they asked Jesus' disciples, can you cast the devil out of this person? How many of y'all believe that there's such a thing as angels? Anybody believe that there's such a thing as angels? How many of y'all believe there's such a thing as fallen angels, right? There's angels and there must be demons. People have different beliefs on their origin. That doesn't really matter where they come from or, or what their origin is. How many know you just don't want them around? If they're around, you want them gone. Can I get an amen out there, right? So they bring this demon-possessed kid to Jesus and or to the disciples. The disciples are trying to cast the devil out of this person, and the devil won't come out. They're, they're saying, come out, and they're, they're in there sweating, and they're praying, and they're singing, and they're dancing, and I don't know what all they're doing. They might have tambourines and shofars and flags and anoint them with oil. Nothing's happening. And they come and get Jesus, and Jesus comes to the person with the devil, says, come out. And you know what the devil does? The devil comes out and the person sets up in their right mind. Now, if you hang out here long enough, you'll see somebody manifest a devil. They're still around. Did you know that? They're still around. And, um, you know, a lot of times when we're ministering in, in, in the prayer line or something like that, one will show up. Sometimes they growl. Sometimes they fall on the ground. They do all kinds of stuff. They, people will seize up and fall down. A lot of medical people will always think it's a medical condition. Sometimes it's not a medical condition. It's a spiritual condition, right? And you got to know what it is and deal with it. Uh, those of you watching in Owensboro right now, when we first went to Owensboro and started the church, all the time, probably the first five, ten years I was there preaching, I would preach just the simple gospel. Jesus died for your sins. He shed his blood for you, right? He died on the cross, went to the whipping posts. He, he absolutely spilled his blood so that we could be forgiven. He said it is finished, died on the cross, was placed in the tomb, was there for three days, on the third day resurrected in power, and he's coming back to receive his church. If you'll repent of your sins, call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved, you'll be forgiven, you'll be washed, you'll be cleansed. God will change you from the inside out. And when I would preach that message... We'd be standing up. I'd do it at the end of a song service often, right? Because I got everybody's attention then. And, and we hadn't been talking for hours where people can still hear what we have to say. All of a sudden, all the time, people would seize up and they'd fall to the ground. Or somebody would, would scream and pass out. Start seizing and knocking, knocking chairs over and stuff like that. And it was a devil. You know why the devil does that whenever you're preaching the gospel? Because the ultimate form of spiritual warfare is the verbal proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Let me say that again. The ultimate form of spiritual warfare is the verbal proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. When you preach the gospel, the gospel has the power to set the captives free. When you preach the gospel, the gospel has the power to heal the sick. When you preach the gospel, the gospel has the power to change someone's eternal resting place. Can I get an amen? So whenever you preach that, demons get uncomfortable. They would start trying to mess up what you're doing. So they don't want the gospel hurt. So you go over to the person. The devil's just manifested in. Right? I, I don't talk to devils. I got some friends that think they want to talk to a devil or something. Why would you talk? I don't like talking to liars. 
How many of you, you, somebody is an habitual liar? How many of y'all get tired of that, right? Anybody got a family member to rather lie to you and tell you the truth? Right? I know some people like that. You know what I do? I stop talking to them. Because it's all a bunch of junk anyway. Amen? Why am I wasting my time? Same way with the devil. Here's what you say to a devil. You say, shut up. Right? I'm careful. I pull the mic away when I do it because I don't want you to think I'm talking to the person. I don't want to be rude to the person. Right? So I'm, I'm sweet to the person. But I'm tough to the devil. So you better know your authority when you talk to the devil. It's like an animal. If you work with large stock, horses know if you're scared of them or not. How many of chihuahuas know if you're scared of them or not? <laughs> Amen? Huh? Hamsters know if they're in charge or you're in charge. Hey, some of you parents, toddlers know if you're in charge. Are they in charge? That's why sometimes mom and dad can't control that kid, but grandma can. So grandma will tan your hide and everybody knows it. Right? Same way with the devil. Right? It knows whether you are scared of it or it's scared of you. So it's be quiet, then come out. And you know what they have to do? They come out. Amazing thing, Jesus shows up, casts out that devil, boom. And here's what he turns around. They, they say, listen, Rabbi, why couldn't we cast the devil out? Why couldn't we get that kid out of this situation? He turns around, this, he says this, this kind only comes out by prayer and by fasting. See, you have authority. You have more power than the devil. Greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. Come on, there's an authority on the inside of you that is unlike anything else in this world, but you got to believe it. Tap into it. Prayer and fasting helps you tap into the authority that you've already been given. It's not necessarily raising your authority. It's just showing you how you can flow in the authority that you already have. Here's why we need to pray and fast. How many of you think the church of the Lord Jesus Christ needs to get its authority back in 2023? How many of you think the church in America needs a revival again in 2023? How many of you think our kids need more power in our churches than lies they're getting in the schoolhouse in 2023? We're only going to have that for a church of prayer and fasting. I don't know about you, but I'm excited for this fast. How many of y'all think God's going to do something in our church when we pray and fast? God's going to move heaven and earth on our behalf. Somebody give God a hand clap at every location. I'm telling you, we're going to pray, we're going to fast, and there's going to be power. Here's the first thing fasting is going to do in our life this week. Fasting is going to raise the level of our authority or let us tap into the authority we've already been given. Come on, turn to your neighbor, just tell them you're getting more authority. You have, you're going to understand understand your authority. We could say it like that. You're going to understand your authority in 2023. Second thing I'll say that fasting does is fasting puts an edge back on your life. Fasting puts an edge back on your life. Prophetic edge. That's an edge that understands what God's doing. Doesn't mean you're a prophet or doesn't mean that. We can all prophesy though. We can all hear the voice of God. Can I get an amen? Fasting puts a prophetic edge. I see us all as we're like, we're like blades. We're like weapons in the hand of God. We're in a spiritual war. Do you understand that? We are, we are right smack dab in the darkest war I think our land's ever seen. And we are close to the end. The end is near. So the war that's been going on behind the scenes in the spirit is becoming more obvious in the natural. Because as the end approaches, the spiritual will become more natural all the time. The wicked will become more wicked at the end. Why do you think drag queens are fighting to have your children in their shows right now? It's, a, it's an overt wickedness, right? Why do you think simple things are being confused in our culture like, what is a man? Dear God, that's such a tough question now. How many know that's been settled since the Garden of Eden? Can I get an amen? Why is it like that? Well, the wicked is becoming more out in the open. Tell you what, I think those that are, that are righteous and move in the power of God, that's going to come, become more out in the open as the end approaches as well. Wicked's coming up, but I'll tell you what, the power's coming up in our midst. What does God need? He needs a group of prophetic people. People with an edge. People, people that got a sharp blade. I see every, every, every person, you're like, you're a weapon in the hand of God. Drive back to camp of the enemy. But what happens, if you've been in a lot of battles, your blade gets dull. It just does. If you ever used a chainsaw, you got to have the you got to have it sharpened every now and then, don't you? 
Even a powerful chainsaw that's running right won't cut a tree down if the blade gets too dull. So you take it to a skilled man that knows how to sharpen it. Next thing you know, you're chopping down trees. Tell you what, I've been in a lot of battles throughout the years. Battles for souls and battles for people and battles for churches. Battles for building. Battles for the right to worship in America. I know what it is to get dinged and my blade to get messed up and broken. You know what it takes? Life does that to you. You better have a time where you retool. You better have a time where you refocus. You better have a time when you get sharpened again. Come on, what God's going to do with this church in January is he's going to sharpen us again. That blade, that edge is coming back on our life. That prophetic thing that slices through all the lies and shows the truth. I think it's coming back into our life. Fasting is going to put an edge on us. Third thing fasting does is fasting sets the stage for breakthrough. There are some things some of you have been dealing with for decades. You had not gotten free from it yet. And it's not that you're bad people, right? It's just that you're bound. I met a lot of people. It wasn't that they were bad. They wanted to do something different. They didn't want to be in the state they were in. They didn't want to be addicted. They didn't, they didn't want to be bound by this thing. They, were, they weren't necessarily bad to the core, but they were bound. Sometimes it's like they just can't get out of that. Some, some people have like a jealous thing on their life. They can't get out of it. Not necessarily they're bad, but they're, they're bound. I'm, I've met a few women throughout the years that wouldn't let their husbands or boyfriends come to church because there were prettier women at the church than they were. That's being bound. Can I get an amen? If I can't go somewhere where there's anybody better looking than me, I can't leave the house, right? It's like, dear God, how do you live like that? You got to get delivered from yourself. Amen? Life in the beauty contest. Thank God. All the bald men said amen this morning, right? Just saying. Right? You need breakthrough. What does a fast do? Set you up for a breakthrough in life. I remember when I first came into the kingdom, I was bound by so many things. Right? So many. I was like in a revolving door. Has anybody ever been here before? About the time you think you're getting out, it'll pull you right back in. Out, pull you right back in. Just circular in your life. And I'll tell you, I learned that there were certain things that's like, I'm going to have to crucify my flesh. And I figured out that I could fast. When I fell back into repetitive behavior, if I would go on a fast, I'd say, if you're going to do this, if I get into this, I started to talk to my flesh. If you do this again, I'm going to put you on a three-day fast quicker than you know what's happened to you, right? And before long, you know what happens? Breakthrough power would hit my life. Huh? I put out the last cigarette, never picked it up again. Come on, somebody. Right? Yeah, get, getting rid of some of the language. Fasting can help you clean up your mouth. You don't have to talk like a sailor anymore. Amen. Fasting. You don't have to keep getting bombed. Can I get an amen, church? Fasting can help you get out of some of this stuff. Right? It'll give you breakthrough in your life. Last thing that fasting does that I'll talk about this morning is fasting quietens the distractions of this world. How many of you notice this world's got some distractions, doesn't it? You got a phone in your pocket, you got a distraction every few minutes. Notifications, texts, emails, right? Social media, boom. Uh, there's a strange set of AirPods, AirPods following me. Who is that? I don't know. Boom, it's there. Just keeps coming. Every one of those distractions, they say a lot of them will take you off task almost 40 minutes. So what people that teach efficiency in workplace, 40 minute distraction, right? They keep coming. There are so many things that want our attention now. How does God himself get our attention? How does God himself get it? Well, I'll tell you what. Whenever you fast, I believe the distractions go away. and helps you focus on God. How many of y'all want to focus on God at the beginning of this year? Hear his voice and have him set us up for some real success in life. I'm going to give you some practical ways you can fast. We're going to fast for the next seven days. Seven days, every campus, we're proclaiming a fast. A fast isn't something you wishy-wash into. You proclaim it. You say, this is what I'm going to do. This is how long I'm going to do it. All right? And if you mess up, don't kick yourself and beat yourself up. Just receive the grace of God. If you break down and have a triple cheeseburger, double-decker fries, right, green chili and cheese, God has grace for you. Amen. That's what I'll say. But here's some ways. Here's, here's what a fast is, what a fast isn't. All right, so... So really what a fast is, is fast is abstaining from food. All right, 
Everybody say abstaining from food. Let's say it again, abstaining from food. One more time, abstaining from food. All right, if you're a member of his church, please don't tell people you're fasting social media. It embarrasses me as a pastor and a Bible teacher. I'm embarrassed for the pastors when people in their church say that. It's good to abstain from social media. Can I get an amen? And that can be a spiritual renewal, but it's not a fast. Don't redefine what the word fast means. How many words have definitions for a reason? And call it what it is according to the Bible. Can I get an amen out there? How many of y'all think the way the Bible defines things is the way Christians should talk about things? Come on, somebody give God a hand clap if you think it just makes sense, right? Fasting is abstaining from food. Uh, abstinence can be a lot of things, right? A lot of different things. But, but fasting is food. Uh, you know, it's a fast. It's not I'm smoking ultralights instead of reds. I'm on a fast. That is not a fast, right? Uh, a fast, it's not a fast. Fast is stopping for food. Here's some different ways you can fast. Number one, there's a water fast. Jesus went into the wilderness 40 days, tempted of the devil. He ate no food. He only drank water. It's a water fast, all right? Moses goes up for 40 days on the mountain with God in the Old Testament, drinks no water, nor eats any food. How does he stay alive? Well, he's in the manifest presence of God the whole time. Glory cloud. That's not going to work for you unless you see a cloud and God calls you up on a mountain, right? So it's, it's a water fast. But you can go a long time on water. Now, if you got health issues, talk to your doctor. Here's my disclaimer to make our attorneys happy. Talk to your doctor. See about it. I'm not a doctor. But I know this. Most of us will not die from stopping eating in America. I think I'll be just fine, right? I think I'm going to make it. Right? I think I, I can fast probably as long as I want, and I'll be all right till probably day 117 or something for me personally. Uh, some of you are thinner, so you're in a different situation. Uh, a, a fast is, is there's a water fast. Jesus went on them. Paul, Peter, all of the New Testament apostles, Mary went on them, read through the book of Acts. They fast corporately together all the time. They would pray, and they would fast. Uh, we're going to fast for seven days. Listen, if you are working hard labor outside, men and women that do that kind of work are very tough work. Um, I would not, I don't be hard on yourself if you can't make it on a water fast. I'll give you an example. I pastor. So like I'm riding a desk and a chair most of the days, right? My, my labor's not that physically strenuous except when I preach. This is the only time it's real strenuous. My brother runs the stockyards, all right, we were doing a water fast a few years ago. I think he was in like his second week or something like that, just drinking water. He's out there processing thousands of head of cattle that day, sorting cattle in the alley and doing hard work, and he almost goes down. He said, I have to eat something. I said, man, eat something, right? You're doing different work than I'm doing. I'll be fine. If you're digging a ditch, do what makes sense for you is all I'm saying. How many of y'all think we ought not judge ourselves or be hard on ourselves? We ought to find something that works on what we do to get God, our attention on God. Can I get an amen out there? That, that's what makes sense. Make it, make it work, right? Uh, ladies that you got little kids, you're nursing, you're childbearing years, you get a free pass. Don't fast, all right? You get a pass, amen? Like Jesse had kids for 10 years, so she didn't have to fast. That's why we had our third one, wasn't it, honey? That's why we kept going. Um, I don't find, I can't find one woman anywhere in the Bible that does an extremely long extended fast, right? Daniel does 21 days, Jesus does 40, Moses does 40. They're men. All right, men and women are different, our bodies are different, our systems are different, right? Makes sense. Your body has to work a different way than mine does, ladies. Uh, we still believe that it is church by the way. Your gender is not fluid, you are a man or a female from conception. The world's lying to you, we love you enough to tell you the truth. All right. So there's a water fast. Second kind of fast is a Daniel's fast. If you want to hear about a Daniel fast, you ought to read in the book of Daniel. I think it's Daniel chapter 10. Look it up. You'll be able to find it very easily. Daniel's an older leader, Persian Empire, a satrap, very powerful man with a lot of responsibilities. He has a vision, sees an angel. Angel reveals some stuff to him, but Daniel can't figure it all out. So he goes on a fast. When you don't know what you need to do next, and you've seen something from the Lord, you need discernment, one of the best things you can do is go on a fast. Daniel fast, this is where the term Daniel fast comes on. Here's what Daniel says he'll do. Daniel says, I will eat no uh, meat at that time. I will have no sweets, or it calls it pleasant bread, any good bread. 
He's only eating what he has to eat to stay alive. Probably fruits, vegetables, things like that. And he drank no fruit of the vine. Had no wine. Um, probably wasn't drinking Dr. Pepper. Can I get an amen, right? He's, he, he's not having shakes or anything like that. He, he, he's fasting. And he did that for 21 days, then God shows up. Uh, Daniel's fast, I think, is harder than a full fast. Because with a full fast, after three days, first, first three days are terrible. Now, if you hadn't, for, hadn't eaten for three days, on the fourth day, I feel like there's resurrection that hits your life, right? Third day's over, next day, kind of your body stops being hungry. And then you don't care if you eat again. A lot of times don't care if I eat again until like the third week of fasting. Food doesn't even matter. Uh, uh, a lot of times you had not eaten in a long time. Smelling food is almost as fun as eating food. And so I go to the roadhouse and I just walk around and I sniff people's lunch, you know, after church. Just walk around in there smelling people's rolls and stuff like that. And uh, can I smell that baked potato for a minute? That looks good. And, and, and you know, you, you just, you go that way. So Daniel fast might be a good option for some of you. Then there's also the third kind of fast is a partial fast. And those are people that are saying, I'm going to fast breakfast and lunch, only eat dinner. Or they pick something like that. Um, for young kids, right? I don't push young kids to do crazy radical fasts. They're growing. I let them do what they feel like and, and, and kind of abstain from some things, but start to get it in their world and get it in the way they think, get it in their spiritual disciplines. So they're not if you fast kind of people when they grow up. Come on, our kids will be when you fast kind of people when they grow up. Can I get an amen out there? I said our, our kids are going to be powerful like that. Here's what I want you to do at every location. Go, go ahead and stand up on your feet. We're going to go nine days or seven days, excuse me, where we're going to fast. It says nine on the clock in the back of the wall. Seven days we're going to fast. And we also have this. Our sanctuaries are going to be open for three hours each day. There's a schedule online you can follow. The hours of prayer for the Jewish people, there are three hours of prayer. For us, it's 9, 12, and 3 in the afternoon. And we're going to have people in the sanctuary praying for you and praying for your family, right? Calling out to God, the maker of the heavens of the earth, on your behalf. How many are thankful that our church prays for us? Amen. Y'all thankful that the people in our church are praying for us and our families? We're going to do that. And uh, they'll let you know when we dismiss this service how you can sign up or be a part of that as well. We're going to pray and we're going to fast. Right now, I want to ask the people in the room, how many of y'all will fast something with us the next seven days? Going to do some kind of fast? Let me see your hands right now. Keep your hands up. Y'all take the pictures of them right now. We have their commitments right now. Amen? We're going to fast for seven days. And there's going to be a power in it. Why are we fasting seven days? You know, I, I thought a lot, a lot of visitors will come back to church next week. They're not going to make it on the first because they did whatever they did last night. But they'll come back next week. And I want us prayed up, and I want us fasted up, and I want us connected with God for when they get here. Amen? And we're going to fast for them this year. They're going to come here, and God's going to change and touch their lives. The power of God's going to be present in here. He really, really, I said the power of God is going to be present in here. The power of God's going to be present in Owensboro. power of God's going to be present in Henderson. power of God's going to be present in Amarillo. We're going to fast and pray for seven days. This next week, bring your whole family. We're going, to, we're going to pray for everybody, anoint everyone with oil that wants to be anointed, and we're going to bless their 2023 by faith. We're going to pray. We're going to seek God all week on your behalf. This next week, there'll be miracles. There'll be power released. There'll be people's lives marked. Man, I'm telling you, God's going to do big things. So we're going to do the win news. We're going to pray. We're going to fast. First of the year, we always do a His Honor offering. We're going to give together corporately too. And God's going to bless the rest of the year. I want you to lift a hand to heaven if you're comfortable with it. I want to pray for you. Pray God to show Himself strong in this fast. Father, right now I pray for the people of His church. I pray that you would bless them, lead them, guide them, help them. Lord, I release the power of God and the grace of God into their life. Do what only you could do in them. Bless, move. I, I pray you reveal yourself to them. I pray you put our edge back on our life. I pray you deliver us from the evil one. I say there's breakthrough coming into your house and into your marriage, into your family, into your body, in, into, into vision. There's fresh vision coming back to lives. Talking of there's going to be such radical changes coming through this fast. 
We're going to look back and say God was with us. In Jesus' mighty name. Bless my friends. Now, if you're out here under the sound of my voice and you're not right with Jesus Christ of Nazareth, listen, God loves you. He's for you. He's not against you. He's not against you. He's for you. Amen. You may not be right with him. Maybe you were years ago, but it's a distant memory and you need to come home. He died for your sins, was placed in a tomb on the third day, resurrected by the power of God. If you'll repent of your sins, call in his name, you'll be forgiven. You'll be right with him. Just close your eyes with me if you're out there. You say, Pastor, I need that in my life. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. When I count to three, just lift your hand up right where you are. You need to come home. You need to rededicate your life. Lift your hand up. One, don't put it off. Two, this is your moment. Come on, three, God, save me. Just lift up that hand right there with your heart. I see you right there. God bless you. I see you. God bless you. Anyone else, lift up your hand right there at home online if you need that. Those of you who have lifted your hand, here's what I want to do. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'll give you some words to pray. God will give you the, 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 the blessing and the miracle of forgiving you. Church, let's pray out loud with them. Say this to God. That's what prayer is, talking to God. Let's say this. Say, say Father, I'm a sinner. I've lived for myself. I've done my own thing. But today, I repent. I turn from my sin to Jesus. I believe on his death, on his burial, on his resurrection for my salvation. Come into my heart. Save me. Forgive me. Fill me with your spirit. I boldly declare that Jesus is my Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen, 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 amen.